Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of What's Next Live with my dear friend, Ray Wang. Welcome to the show. Look, I've been on your show like three times, and this is the first time you've been on mine. I can't believe it. So how are you? Where are you? What's going on? You know, hey, thanks a lot for having me. I'm here in New York City. And, uh, you know, I think I just saw you last at my book tour in Venice Beach. So thanks for stopping by. But I'm really excited. Uh, you know, this is a great show. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, it's an exciting time for you. You are launching. Is this your second book or third book? Second book? This is my second official book. The other ones, please don't read. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with that. So your second <laughs> official book called Everybody Wants to Rule the World, not to be confused with the song. You know, it's uh, we got to go find Kurt Smith. I think he lives in the L.A. area and uh, it's an open invitation. Kurt, if you're out there, I will invite you to come play uh, out here in San Francisco when we do the launch on the 26th or 27th. But no, it's not to be confused with that, but it's really talking about the state of the world and what's going on. Well, you know, look, you have such an amazing bird's eye view of what's happening, both from a tech perspective, a market and industry perspective on a global basis, right? You um, are part of and the, you know, sort of the face of Constellation Research um, as well. You've spent a lot of time on the other side of the house, you know, in tech as well as in the consulting world. And so I'd love to hear what prompted you to write the book, because I'm going to guess it was starting to be written long before COVID. Um, and then here we are, you know, as we're starting to open things back up, it's a great time to launch something like this. But what sort of sparked your inspiration to put pen to paper or finger to keyboard for the second book? <laughs> Actually, you're right. Actually, I still write by hand. Um, so it was a written manuscript to get the ideas out there and flowed. And then somebody got them typed. But the genesis of the idea was the fact that we were working on digital transformation projects like you. We've been watching people, you know, transform sales organizations, customer service, you know, business models, what was happening in commerce, what's happening outside in terms of supply chain and logistics. And the challenge really was the fact that digital transformation appeared not to be doing much. It wasn't enough. And the question is, it wasn't, you know, it was like it made incremental improvements. You got 30%, 40% gains, but there was a class of companies that were outpacing everybody. And we called these the digital giants. And we tried to understand what they were doing that was different. You know, was it a different management team? Was it a, you know, different technology that they were using? You know, did they have different processes? And it turned out it wasn't any of those things. Okay, so <laughs> what was it? I guess that was the hook, right? It wasn't any of those That's things. The hook. So what was it? <laughs> Well, we, we talked to about 10,000 folks uh, from 2015 on uh, who are early adopters. We've got this thing called the Business Transformation 150. There are top transformation experts around the world. Uh, we name these people every year and we try to look at their projects, try to understand how they're doing it. And the digital giants were doing something different. And let me give you an example. So if we take a comp if we take the food delivery apps, for example, and we looked at how they were succeeding in the market and the pandemic was really kind to them. I, they were basically the heroes of the pandemic. Uh, but if you take a look at what they're doing, you know, small businesses typically had people come to the restaurants. They weren't very digitized. You didn't even have digital ordering. And suddenly the pandemic hits and these folks are like, oh, we can help you deliver your orders. Right. We can help you take the orders. We can even give you a cut of what's going on. And what they ended up doing was a couple things. The first part was what we call customer account control disintermediation. Basically, the small restaurants pretty much handed their customers to the food delivery apps. The food delivery app companies ran with it, right? They took their payment information, they got their preferences. Pretty soon, instead of calling you know, the restaurant that you go to once every three weeks, you go to the food delivery app first. And that's where the customer account control disintermediation occurred. The second thing was this battle for data supremacy. And so the data from all the purchases that were being aggregated from all the restaurants wasn't going to the restaurant. And even if it did, it wasn't going to help them. It was going to the food delivery app, which said, hey, Tiffany, you know, in your zip code, people like Thai food more than they like German food. And over in this other zip code, people like Italian more than they like Chinese. And over here, there's more vegans, right? And that data became aggregated over time. And, you know, an individual restaurant might have a thousand customers, but these folks had millions millions of customers, and they also ended up building the network. And so the combination between the network, the data, and the customer account control disintermediation gave them a chance to build new types of monetization models. Pretty soon they were thinking, hey, maybe we should put a ghost kitchen up. Hey, we can actually you know, do placements on ads and search. And they got digital monetization better than everyone else. But here's the kicker. 
they could lose hundreds of millions of dollars a year and the restaurants couldn't. Uh, even a Domino's, which would go head on with them, that had a great delivery model, that was a poster child for winning in digital transformation, they were up against companies that could lose hundreds of millions. And that is one of the interesting challenges. That long-term mindset inside these, which is the fifth element, those long-term mindset really allows these digital giants to win and get to that escape velocity. Well, there's so many things that you said there, right? And I often use restaurants as an example that they, that a particular restaurant might have had a thousand customers, but that didn't mean they knew who they were. And also if it was an in-dining experience and they might know, oh, Tiffany comes in with her family or Ray comes in with his family, you know, every Tuesday night. <clears throat> and then the pandemic hits and it's Tuesday, but I don't know how to get in touch with Ray or Tiffany. And so all of a sudden a 99.9% .9 in-person restaurant is overnight shifted to you know digital and delivery and they don't even know where to begin they don't have their menu on their website etc and so everybody has covered how much digital acceleration has happened over the last 18 months um but i think what you just uncovered was it, it's not just the transformation it's the data and the usage of it in those new ways so i know that you have um sort of a framework that you've outlined in uh, rule the world maybe you can kind of start at the top so that people can understand based on that example you just gave how they could even look at their own organization and make sure they're capitalizing on all the opportunity they have in front of them well what i prescribe was really just how digital giants do it and those are the five steps but if you're an existing company trying to do it it's very different you have to add two more steps and the first one is really rethink that life cycle of organizations inside your, your company right you know when we first build a company you have you know, an awesome mission and purpose, right? And you get out there as a dynamic founder that leads that, you know, initiative. Then you go out and find the biggest talent networks and you use, you know, the best place to work as a kind of anchor to get you there. But then you start figuring out what's the offering. Using great design, you get a product out there, the minimum viable offering comes out. And then of course you start going after markets, you become a category, you know, king, a category queen, you go out and win that market. And then you go public. I'm so sorry. Then you go public. It's horrible. Now you're competing on EBITDA and revenue per employee and profit per sale. And you suddenly forget what the company is about. And if you're like a 20 to 30 year old company, you hit mid midlife crisis and you don't even understand why you're there. Things are just going on and, and you're in trouble. And, and so as a company in that state, you have to think about turnaround catalysts and turnaround catalysts are key to making that shift. And sometimes it's an owner operator coming in to change the organization. Sometimes it's restructuring the cap table. Sometimes it's really thinking about changing the way you look at new technologies that impact your product offering. Sometimes it's about building two-sided marketplaces and data value chains. And then, of course, it's reigniting your investors to understand that you're going for long term. But you can't do just one of those. You have to do all five of those to reinvent that life cycle of organizations. Now, along with the two, uh, the five other things, which we talked about, which is customer account control disintermediation, winning on data supremacy, uh, you know, building the largest network you can, digital monetization, which is ads, search, membership, subscriptions, goods and services, there's an important piece that you add to the long-term mindset. You have to build joint venture partnerships. And when you're a smaller organization going up against digital giants, you gotta remember, they're investing at 10x the levels you are for capital, for innovation. They're investing at 10x the resources towards building new products and expanding in markets. They're built for growth, not value. They're built for growth. And because of that, you're probably going to have to pull together partnerships, create a separate entity so that you can actually compete against these digital giants effectively. And you'll organize yourself around three ways. One is common enemy. Let's all go after company X, right? One will be around data value chains, basically taking an industry and understanding the, the network of data and where it actually flows, and you might take that entire piece, not industries, data value chains. And then there's gonna be the collapse of multiple value chains by industries and data. So take comms, media, entertainment, tech, and software, it's really the same stuff. You got content that goes out into a distribution channel that's delivered on a technology platform that goes to customer networks. Doesn't matter if you're selling games, software, doesn't matter if you're trying to sell you know, media or a subscription, it all works the same. And once you see that, that's a very different model. And then the last one is common good, right? You could build a commonwealth of self-interest. Our buddy Paul Greenberg was talking about that. That's where you actually create a public good. Maybe nonprofits get together to pull information and data, or maybe you know um, universities or public sector agencies get together and bring together mass quantities of information and insight so that can be shared and reused. Well, so 
you know, I, I often get asked this question. So I understand how the digital guys have done it. You know, I'm a small company, right? Or I'm an individual contributor in a big company or a small company. And I, I hear you, Ray, and I read your book and I, you know, follow what you say. What's my first step, right? Because I think that there was a lot of buzzwords, a lot of things you said, um, all valid, right? And, and all clear, but sometimes it's, where do I even begin? Like, where do I take that first step to try to begin to compete against these digital giants? Because, you know, in, in many markets, they are so powerful um, that, you know, you tend to run up against them and you don't know how do I outmaneuver? Do I outthink? I can't outspend. I can't outhire. I can't outdevelop. So what do I do? I think that the first step people have to do is, is really look at their business models and understand the business model and then understand the monetization models. Today, your business model monetization models are two different things. I'll give you a quick example. For example, Google, right? Uh, Google is the dominant player in search. One might say they're a monopoly, but they're really, you know, the dominant player in search. Uh, they have, I don't know, 4 billion users and, you know, they're generating 130 billion in terms of revenue in 2020. Then there's Facebook, right? They're the dominant player in social media. They've got 2.1 or 2.8 billion users, depending on how you're counting it. And, you know, they're doing something like 70 billion in digital ads. Wait, did I just say digital ads? They're both competing in digital ads. Now, if you were to look five years ago, the next competitor had a billion in digital ads. It's probably Microsoft at the time. And so we now have two competitors going head on in digital ads and a third player has emerged called Amazon. Yes, Amazon. Amazon did 14.1 billion in digital ads last year. These are three different business models all competing for digital monetization in the world of ads. Think about that. And so, so that first step is to really rethink where your business models and monetization models are aligned and who are you really competing with? If it's digital goods and services or if it's memberships and subscriptions, are you really competing for memberships and subscriptions or are you really competing for time and attention? And if you're competing for time and attention, you realize that, okay, wait, every brand suddenly is a media property. Every brand is suddenly a content provider. Every brand is suddenly a mission oriented organization. And that changes the way you realize how you reinvent yourself. So you have to start there. Now, once you have that in place, I want you to imagine the biggest network, right? Of people, devices, intersections of that, you know, members that are part of another organization or of your extended partner network and identify that biggest network because it's about getting to that scale and being able to connect to that scale. Now, one of the things that we always look at is, you know, adoption and in adoption, 50 million users is the standard for a hey, mass adoption. 75 years. That's what it took for, you know, radio to actually get to 50 million users. But then you had like Facebook Live that did in 24 hours. Right. And that's what we're trying to get to, because if you have the network. I get massive adoption. I drive down my customer acquisition costs. And more importantly, I can introduce new products with amazing agility and speed. So creating a network, you know, requires things, right? You can't just go, I'm going to get 50 million people who might want to do things with me. Right. It's am I spending enough money to attract people to want to join my network? Am I willing to share data with that company in order for them to provide these in, in you know better services and products to me you know there's lots of things that have to happen to create that network if i'm like well i have a network of a hundred or that restaurant i have a network of a thousand you know okay i mean no it's scale. amazing it's better than a network of nobody or one right so that is progress but multiplying that network in a way that um you're you're capturing that time and attention you know, attracting people to want to join your community, whatever that might be, could be your, you know, as a service, could be your, you know, gym, it could be your application, whatever it is. Um, and, and then you have to collect that data to start to monetize it to produce new products and potentially services based on that. But we have a crisis of trust around data. We, you know, we have a crisis of trust around breaches of data. Um, and it's also very noisy in attracting. We were talking about this before the show, just how noisy it's become. And I don't mean noise in a bad way. I just mean there's a lot of options today. And so, you know, once again, if you can't end sp outspend, because as you said, Facebook, Google, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, whomever it might be, has such massive mind share because they're everywhere, you know? So what, what, what would you say in 
how would you create that network or that, you know, uh, interest from someone who wants to join? So if you don't have a network effect, <laughs> where do you begin? This is where the coalitions are important. It's really about getting that interest in communities, getting that interest in memberships, subscriptions, uh, people's lists. Uh, they become very important if you're trying to get the scale. Now, let's be honest, right? Consumer scale is very different than enterprise scale. Enterprise, like you need the list of 20,000 executives. That's a great number if you've got 20,000. 1,000 does wonders when your average sale is, what, 100 to 200,000, you know, for your deal size. So, so let's remember, right, you know, very different for B2B versus B2C. Uh, and, and, you know, if you have that kind of list, so LinkedIn is a great membership network, you know, I mean, Tiffany, you've got like tens of thousands of folks that, you know, follow you or connected to you. And, you know, that in itself is its own network, but let's take it at scale. Let's look at LinkedIn as a great example. LinkedIn has 720 million members. 720 million members. The power of that network is not fully tapped. One of the things I, I, I try to tell LinkedIn folks all the time, but they never, never really pay attention to it. But if you had 700 million members and you actually could do verification of employment, skills, did you go to this school? When did you, you know, work here? Right? By being able to validate and provide that, they could make a ton of money just doing $10 verification employment <laughs> calls or did you actually go to the school? Right? That's a great business. You only need like five developers and probably like you know four API calls to be able to do that and just get all the, uh, get light up the network of all the providers and you know institutions and skills companies that are all there. Right? I feel like there's a brand a, new building. I feel like there's a blue check coming. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you heard it here first. The blue check is coming. All right, keep going. Right. <laughs> so, but so, yeah, but this is it, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, so, so even if you, even if like a hundred million people, you know, use that service and use six of those services or even 10, let's use 10 to make it easy. That's a hundred dollars, right? Off of just, you know, a hundred million people. That's not a bad number. <laughs> so, right. I mean, right. I mean, this, this is what, this is what they're missing, right? You can get to billion dollars in less than like, you know, six months building this and launching it. So, so yeah, that's the kind of scale we're looking at. And so that's why it's important to look at networks uh, in the way that you're talking about. Well, we've got a great question here from Ed. I'm going to share it below. And uh, thanks, Ed, for joining. Um, so who owns the data? Is it me? Am I the product? What do you think? Hey, Ed, great seeing you in New York a couple of weeks ago. Um, you are the product. Um, we got to change a couple of things, right? This gets to the regulatory environment of what happens and how do you keep fair and free markets. Uh, but you are the product at the moment. But if we change a few things and we make data a property right, personal data a property right, now we actually have existing property laws inside all the different countries and states and localities that can apply. So what do I mean by that? I don't know. You own land, you own property, you get a title, like your car, right? Your house. Uh, you've got a great idea. You have a trademark, a service market. That's, that's intellectual property. Now, all that information about you, the digital exhaust, your PII, your genomic information, that's also your personal data. And so when they change the framework so that becomes labeled as personal data and property, the property rights kick in. And now you can actually trade that data, share that data, be paid to be used that data. There's a value exchange and there's consent that's required. And therefore at that point, Ed, you know, the, you are the product, but they need your consent to be able to use it. And people will be finding fair market value against that data. Well, I guess then the follow up question would be, you know, what's the likelihood of digital giants actually compensating consumers for their personal data? I think we'll see that happen. That will be a differentiator. But before we do that, we actually have to, you know, there's there's five bills in the House Democratic proposals for antitrust. And I like one of them a lot, which is really access, which is data portability. Just like we have number portability. Remember back in the day, like you wanted to change your phone like number, but you couldn't because you're stuck on a carrier so that you were stuck there. And if you left, you had that you couldn't take your number with you. Well, <laughs> that's number portability. Those were the days. Those are the days, right? You know, your Macaw cellular one, if you're any rumors. <laughs> right. But those were the days with A B carriers and you know, they wouldn't give you your number. But but that's the same thing with data portability. Like I can't get all my metadata off of Facebook or I can't get my data off of Twitter, right? You know, they should provide an on ramp to a competitor to be able to go do that. 
I think it's hard to enforce or hard to build, but it is a noble idea in the sense that that data will be reused. It's your information and it should be given to you and all the derivatives of that. So we'll see how far they get with that. So. Well, and, and, and then I guess, you know, since you mentioned sort of the bills that are that are in front around uh, data, we there's so much conversation about breaking up big tech and that it's too big. Uh, and, and I, you know, there's, I have my own feelings, but this is not the show to hear mine. This is all about you. <laughs> I will uh, interview you on our show. Nope, is, yeah. is, uh, is, I'd say this. What would we have been over the last 17 months without tech? <laughs> So, so my feeling about this is a little different, right? I know there are people that you know, have good intentions. They want to break up big tech. It looks like a monopoly. You know, it's antitrust. These large companies are bad. I just don't want to take the European view around this because when I look at Europe and I realize how small their institutions are and how they can't scale to compete against China, I mean, the scale is really important. Scaling is what's driving down costs. Scaling is what's giving you constant streams of innovation. Scaling is what gives you the ability to actually, you know, create networks that are valuable. And so when you break those up, you better do that with a very, very fine, precise approach if you're going to do it. And you also better look at the cost benefit analysis before you go there. And I don't think that's in a lot of these rules and this thinking. It's just like, oh, you're just big. Right. And a classic example that we talk about this in the book, it's like, you know, that. Google versus Apple and, you know, mobile OS, right? Google's dominant. They're 80% of the market share. They must be the monopoly. Yeah, but Apple is 20%, but you make two, Apple's doing two to one ratio in terms of revenues, right? With less of a market base, right? It's massive competition there, massive innovation. Yeah, I mean, people complain that they have to pay 30% cut to Apple um, in order to put their app on the app store. But you, if you're like a, you know, like a beer distrib, you know, like a beer company or like a, package food distributor and you want to put your stuff in the shelf or in the aisle, you pay slotting fees. Those slotting fees are more than 30%. So it's like people that are proposing these rules don't seem to have any business sense or have actually worked in business to understand this is kind of how it works. Someone built the network, someone built the community, you want to use it, you actually have to pay for it. You can't just put yourself there, you know? So so it's interesting to see how this is all going to turn out. I Hopefully some practicalities come out there. But more importantly, I mean, we need good regulations, smart regulations that ensure fair and free markets, but you don't want to just put regulation out there just because it's populist at the moment. We should go all after big tech. Oh, look, hey, I went after big tech in like 2021 so I can run for like Senate next year. I mean, it's like, that's crazy, right? But but that's a little bit of what's going on, so. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'd say this, like, you know, I sort of tongue in cheek said, where would we be without tech over the last 17 months? There is no going back. So now we have to find a way in which tech, human, business, community, society, the planet, you know, all these things can kind of work together. And I think we're in the middle of these growing pains of how do we do that? Like Bitcoin, you know, everyone's like, this is the greatest thing, but it's polluting our environment. So what's the balance, right? Like, is that the answer? So go ahead. You know, we need to go back to the fax machine and thermal paper. That's the future. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't think we are going back. I do agree. We have all these new digital capabilities. It does enable access. It improves the ability for inclusion as people are trying to get in and, and connect. All you really need is a connection point <coughs> to the Internet, and now you have access. Uh, my, my only challenge is this. I don't want to lose my analog capabilities because in a digital world, you lose your privacy. And in an analog world, you maintain your anonymity. And so things like getting rid of cash, like I'm not for that. I believe in privacy and I believe people should be able to make transactions without being traced. Um, you know, if you want to sign a contract by paper, we should still make that option there. I just want to get to a point where it's not like, if, if you're doing something analog, it looks like you're doing something like, you know, suspicious <laughs> or evil, or you're like, you know, just don't get hide from the government. I mean, it should be normal for you to be able to do that. And it should be an option that society pays for to make sure that you still maintain your privacy and anonymity should you like. Um, but, but right now we're not heading in that direction. Now, on the other hand, right, all the innovations in payments, all the innovations in, you know, the ability to order. I mean, there's some great benefits. I mean, think about this. Let's go back to your restaurant since we, we started with the restaurants. If you pre-order your meal before you show up to pick up, like even some restaurants are asking you to pre-order, that's the first time they've actually done order capture. They now know inventory and how much supply they order and how much they really consume. And hey, Wednesday seems to be a big day for Sundays when the temperature is over 90 and it's a Wednesday, you know, we're going to sell a lot more ice cream. But you know, if it's Thursday and over 90, for whatever reason, nobody orders ice cream. They like pie, right? And that's the kind of stuff we discover. And it's those insights that 
have become important. And that's that notion where we talked about earlier about battling for data supremacy. Digital allows you to do that. Every digital action is a demand signal. You've got contacts, you know, the location, the time, the weather, the journey, what was happening, how are you feeling? And you also know the actions that were taken, right? And when you can do that and put that attribution to the context, you now have some really powerful insights. And what we're competing for is this concept called decision velocity. It's so important. You and I make a decision one per second. I don't know, how long does it take you? I want you to put it on the spot, but how long does it take you to get out of management committee, right? Is it one week? Is it three weeks? Is it a quarter, right? It could take you forever. Machines are making a thousand decisions per second. Beat that. That is asymmetry. And that is why decision velocity is so important because we're competing against that. If you can make faster decisions at that type of scale, 10x, 100x, you're going to have a massive competitive advantage. Yeah. And I think people are at a crossroads now. You're either going to go back to the status quo or you're going to sort of double down and reimagine what's possible. And using that example of restaurants and what you just described, I literally remember being in a restaurant in Rome. In Roma, it was 14 years ago, 15 maybe, okay? And they had, you could, they were carrying a device that they could order off the menu that they were no longer writing it down. So of wow. course, yeah, at the time I was working at Gartner. So I like went up to the, and I said, I wanna know the story behind this, right? Because we're not doing it in the US. And so yeah. he goes, yeah, it actually helps me with inventory and supply. I'm not throwing away and wasting food. and. So I said, I really want to use you for a case study, right? About trying to learn how to do that. So this is a small little restaurant in Roma, right? It's family owned. It's this big, you know, it serves the best food. And now he has complete control where he knows that people are ordering veal or they're ordering linguine or they're ordering, you know, lasagna or whatever it is. He goes, it's completely changed my business. I don't have to work as hard. You know, my, my, I know what, how to staff up. My cooks don't run out of things. My patrons, my customers are not upset. And that was 15 years ago, right? So there is so much opportunity that a small business can compete with the digital giants if they make those uh, investments. Well, let's take that a couple steps further. I love that example. And, and let's be honest, having worked in restaurants, you too, and you know the, how it works, he basically was having a problem with like a little bit of a, you know, insider theft of inventory. So he probably solved that pretty quickly with the digital ordering system. But imagine you have a coalition of like independent restaurants that can aggregate the orders for discounting. Right now you have the ability to actually create those networks, right? Because I got demand signals of my customers and that's aggregated for my purchasing and procurement on the back end. And suddenly small businesses have a shot going up against other folks. They could have a direct, you know, Cisco Foods contracts, right? Or US Foods contract, you know, at the bulk buying level. And, and that changes the game and allows them to compete head on with big chains who typically have really good procurement contracts. Well, there's two things I want to wrap this up with. One is, um, you know, as we talk about competing with the digital giants and we talk so much about digital and you made the comment about analog, there's still a lot of inequality around people actually having access to digital at all. You know, we're all listening to this now live streaming across multiple platforms because I have high speed Internet. Right? Ray's in New York. I'm in California. You know, we're doing all these things uh, in a digital sense, but not everybody has high speed Internet. Not everybody has access to computers, you know? And when we start to think more about digital, how do we, what are your thoughts, I guess, around kind of closing this digital divide, you know, uh, and, and what's the role of big tech in, in potentially doing that? And the digital giants, not just big tech. You know, I think the digital giants in general have done a good job of improving access, advocating for more access for broadband in rural areas. I think that's where we're seeing that, um, you know, Telco companies traditionally have taken a long time to go do that, which we totally understand. But, but you know, for $99 and a $400 for equipment, you could have Starlink, right, with 150 meg up and down. And, and you know, you see companies like Starlink disintermediating telcos, right? They don't pay regulatory fees. They don't actually have to worry about this. You know, the government's subsidizing the satellite launches. And suddenly you actually have the northern hemisphere covered with 150 meg up and down, right? And so I think improving access there, you're seeing it happen in different ways. Like Amazon Sidewalk is pretty cool. The fact that they can extend their network through all their devices. So you have like micro networks that pop up, which allow other people to share their internet and push it out there for folks, not just for their devices, but for their connectivity. So, so I think you're seeing that. Apple does that as well with some of their devices now. So I think you're gonna see like broadband be less of a barrier um, in, you know, actually in the, in the US. Now, if you're in a development 
developing world, um, the question is how do you actually facilitate that? And we saw people try to do it with like internet balloons, right? You know, have them up in the air to kind of carry a signal. I think it'll get better. I mean, there's a leapfrog that's occurring where you don't actually have to have, you know, hardwired lines, right? Like I've got cat six cables in my house that are connected to like fiber because I live next to Apple, right? But but you don't need that anymore. Um, and so I think it'll get easier and easier over time. And at least mobile devices have pretty much coverage everywhere. So that's one that I wanted to ask your opinion on. And I love that answer, you know, but you know, you're in Silicon Valley, I'm in Los Angeles. And in the beginning of the pandemic, I was driving through um, going to my local Rite Aid and there was a Starbucks next door, but of course everything was closed, right? We were in a hard lockdown. This was like April and yeah. the parking lot was packed. And I was oh. very confused as to why the parking lot was packed. And sure enough, <laughs> everyone was sniffing Wi-Fi from Starbucks. <laughs> they left the Wi-Fi on. That's awesome. <laughs> right? But you in, in Silicon Valley, there was a story of a kid sitting in front of a, I don't know if it was a McDonald's or a Kentucky Fried Chicken, sniffing the Wi-Fi so he could go to school. So this isn't just rural areas, right? We have this divide everywhere. And so for those of you listening who have any ability to make an impact on this, this is one of those topics I love talking about because we can only hope that we give everyone the opportunity and access to some of the things we're talking about and businesses as well. All right, so the second the second one is supply chain. We also noticed over the last 16 months sort of how fragile our supply chain was. And, and early in the pandemic, I saw so many stories of farmers um, in the Midwest throwing away millions of pounds of potatoes because they just, and yet we have all these people who have uh, food insecurities and are hungry. And so, and now we see, you know, supply chain and chips and, cars and all of a sudden, you know, wood for building homes and wires and everything has gotten more expensive because of this sort of supply chain. So any thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, we had optimized our supply chains and they're really long chains. And so they got to a point where we're optimized, but not resilient. And and that was the challenge, right? I mean, you know, drug manufacturing is down to like, you know, 17 locations around the world. And, and hey, only one of them's in the US, right? Oh, shoot, like, what do we do? Right? It's, it's things like that for other countries, right? And so we got into that level of, you know, scale and efficiency, but we didn't address resiliency. And I think resiliency was really important where, whether it's food, whether it's chips, uh, whether it's, you know, security. I mean, the farmer issue was really interesting because restaurants weren't open. There was no longer that big distribution. And it's really easy to actually, you know, put like 100 pounds or get a pallet or something sent to you, it's really hard to break it into smaller pieces for distribution at the consumer level. And so it was really, we're watching distributors, food distributors have to get rid of food because they didn't know how to sell to individual consumers. But once they solved that, it got a little bit better. But I think we need to actually invest in resiliency, assign a cost to resiliency so that those capabilities are there, especially when we lose one or two sources. I mean, a, a great example is like, there's this battle to get rid of natural gas lines right but if you do that like your power goes out no one's going to be able to cook or heat themselves right and so that resiliency even though there's an ideological reason to get rid of carbon you still want to have other sources right battery backup with solar right if you're going to do like wind right if you're going to do hydro right what's the backup for that i mean and so you got to have multiple sources and we can't just try to get to some level super efficiency without considering the impact of resiliency on supply chains well, Ray, this has been such a great conversation and not to miss the point that your book, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, is coming out. What's the date? July 13th at books, wherever books are sold. So there'll be an audio version, a Kindle version, of course. Um, and of course, you can get the physical hardback. Did you do your Audible? I did my own audio this time. I, it was weird having a uh, you know, well-spoken British individual do mine last time. I realized that I better do my own this time. <laughs> It was an entire experience, like a whole week for eight hours. And then you just are so sick of listening to your book, but your voice. But I can say I personally have read my book word for word now. I can say it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I, won't, I won't be doing the translation, so I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> so. All right. Well, everybody go out, pick up your copy of Everybody Wants to World, uh, Rule the World from my friend uh, and colleague Ray Wong. There's a copy. I would show you mine, but I don't have mine yet. Oh, and Supply I chain resiliency, in effect. <laughs> and I endorse the book and I don't even have one. What's that all about? <laughs> You're getting a special version. So but that is coming. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for this version of uh, What's Next Live. My name is Tiffany Bova. Remember, please go out, buy a copy of Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Thank you again, Ray, for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Hey, what's next? Thank you. What's next? <laughs>